And joining me on the podcast, and of course, live in technically on video, if you want to see the whites of our eyes, and of course, the, the smart cut of Paul's jib, check out the video, Paul Hill, <laughs> full-time investor, equity analyst, and uh, you notice I've got my jumper on, it's, it's nearing March, and the sun's out, but I'm freezing, it's freezing. Yeah, well, it's, supposed to be, it's supposed to be spring, isn't it, this week, so uh, we're, I think it's probably a bit delayed, but we've had a quite a warm uh, February, which has saved actually a lot of Europe, and uh, certainly in the UK with its energy price, uh, prices, but uh, I think I think overall, the sort of like uh, word on on Wall Street has certainly been inflation is, is stickier for longer. And when we saw that coming through last week with the uh, the uh, the PCE, the, the personal uh, consumer expenditure figures, and if you strip out food and energy and and housing, then you were looking at underlying inflation that actually increased month on month, which was what was what the market was worried on. It went from about. Uh, I think it was 0.1% month on month in December to 06 in January, giving you an analyzed level of 47 So what the market's worried now is that uh, you're going to get this inherent services inflation, which is going to be stickier uh, for longer. And then later on in the next two or three months, you're going to start seeing some of the uh, the year-on-year base effects of the goods in deflation, which, which we've enjoyed, then also rolling over. And you saw that in used car prices increasing month on month. So the worry is, actually, is when we come to sort of like late Q2, we're not going to see, we may not see a big decrease in inflation because of that stickiness in services and, and the, the reversal in the, um, in the goods inflation. And what that means for the Fed is they're still going to, they're going to carry on putting their foot to the brake on, um, you know, sort of like the, the economy to, to, to cool it down, which is going to be increasing interest rates. So expectations now built into the US yield curve of of increased considerably and we're looking at a peak rate probably around about sort of like you know five five point two five percent five point five percent by mid next year and then it all comes down how long we're going to you know keep it at that level yeah well do you know what? i was watching uh, like cnbc i think last week there are a panel of people on there five people on there and i think uh four were bearish really bearish and one yeah. was sort of bullish and they, they all give their reasons but I thought you're pretty much predicting but i thought i still felt i mean I think you 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 play it better if you are, are air on the side of caution a little bit. We know inflation is sticky. We know previously, you know, it doesn't come down the straight line. It bounces back up, comes back down, and shakes the market up. But there's been a great rally on the S and P, and it's rolling over now. But I, I just think when I come down to it, I'm thinking, oh, should I? Because I've got, I'm, I'm holding a bit of cash. So should I buy more stocks? And, and I thought at the end of the day, if you are looking, I think nothing more so now than ever. The, the businesses have to be performing, but also you, you've got to get them for a good valuation, you know, just in case mm. the market rolls over. You buy a good company at a good valuation, you should be okay, shouldn't you, really? And uh, sometimes you get a fear of missing out on a company that starts a rally, and that sort of rally we just had on some of the stocks. You think, oh, maybe I shouldn't have bought that. But, uh, listen, you, you know, valuation is, is key at the moment, isn't it? You've got to be careful of valuations. Yeah, yeah. You know? and, then, and then it's sort of like what valuation are you got, you know, you're going to give yourself comfort on? And if you assume a 10-year sort of like, you know, yield on uh, on treasuries of sort of 4%, and then you put in an equity risk premium, and you probably want a 3% on that. Seven, so you basically got essentially an equity um, return of, of minimum of, of 7 or 8%. Then you're looking at sort of like, you know, 14 times PE, 14, 15 times PE to give you that sort of like, that would be a, a normal sort of like neutral level. And then if you want a margin of safety on the top of it. So what you're saying actually is that you're looking for real bargains at sort of like, you know, low teens or 10 or even less than that on, on the PE, unless it's got sort of like, you know, juiced up sort of, uh, growth that can accelerate that uh, that APS level. So yes, certainly, you know, rushing into the market at these current levels probably doesn't make sense. I mean, my, I mean, I've been saying it for some time on social media, but that inversion of the yield curve at sort of like, you know, neg- negative 80 basis points is just throwing out that there's going to be a recession. And mm. it actually could get steeper or more inverted. And why, why I say that is that if, if short term the uh, the Federal Reserve increases interest rates, you know, and its Fed's funds rate, then you might actually see that that in, that increase because the ten year probably isn't going to grow, isn't going to you know expand as as fast as the short term, and therefore you're going to get to probably to about one percent, and then 
really the classic sort of signal of when a recession starts is when that, that curve, that inversion starts to flatten again. It becomes less inverted and even in what they call a bull market steepener because the market, the investors then, it's certainly in the, in the bond market, are saying that the Federal Reserve is going to then have to reduce interest rates because it's, in, it's basically caused a recession. And that could occur probably around about sort of like, you know, Start in start flattening out sort of mid year. Um, it all depends on how the you know sort of like the employment market goes. Because if it doesn't if it doesn't cool off the employment market, is you know the jobs market at three point four percent, we're going to carry on getting inflation you know sticky. And and the Fed's then got a, a really tough decision. It either says I want the inflation coming down to two percent, and as Mohammed Al Arian said last week, if it does if it sticks to that mandate, it's going to crush crush the economy. Mm. Or it decides actually I'm going to go hotter for lo- I'm actually going to have a have a hotter than two percent inflation rate and go to two go to three to four percent in in the interim because I don't want to crush the economy. So either way, it's looking to me not bullish going forward. There's lots of stocks you can buy. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, but I would say I, I'm naturally. I mean, I've been saying it for two or three months. Because I've been seeing this in terms of 2024 EPS estimates coming down, and I, I'm cautious in terms of where to stick, you know, money. I mean, I mean, you've got, have you still got 50 percent cash? Yeah, runabout. Yeah, I mean, the, <laughs> well, okay. The, so the, the decisions I've taken, uh, you know, I've I've got quite a few stocks, but they're only small, you know, sort of yeah. two, three, not even some of them. I think maximum, pretty much, I think is about four percent of total portfolio value, but most of them, are, 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 you know, two, three percent. Um, so yeah, so and that, and that's true. I, I feel they're good businesses, but I think they'll they'll suffer some weakness, and I think you know there may be more opportunities to, to go get it, get some you know more exposure mm. to them because yeah, it is a, a worrying outlook, and if you look at it, I mean. They're talking about the you know the S and P earnings and this guy was giving me there was good arguments back and forth, but at the end of the day, the guys that made more sense was just saying that the valuations of the S and P is still overvalued compared to if you think what's going to happen. With yeah, it's the, eighteen the times. Going yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So you think, and it's easy to have put blinkers on and think, no, everything's going to be okay. But you've got to sort of pay attention to that and thinking, okay, if earnings are going to, you know, deteriorate. Then it, it doesn't justify that valuation, and so uh, and like I say, it's, it's 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 funny the market, isn't it? It's but I have a bit of patience, and it's hard. You know, I find it quite hard to sit on cash, and I've sat in cash for quite a while now. And um, but literally, I'm seeing it's either that or jump in now and then risk to have your portfolio value go down. So um, you know, I, I'm mm. I'm I'm happy to sort of sit on cash for a while. And, uh, well, it was quite interesting, did. actually, because at the weekend, they had the sort of the, the Woodstock moment for global investors with Warren Buffett and uh, Berkshire Hathaway it, releasing its annual results. And it always reminds me of these, you know, they, they talk in sort of like, you know, broad terms, but it's, it's sort of like, um, it certainly um, highlights the sort of key, you know, investment themes, things like, you know, patience is profit. So, you know, look through this and, you know, when you're an investor, rather than be a trader, be a business owner. Or I class it as what most people do is you know it's like a house owner. So you can mm-hmm. so what you're saying there is that you're investing for sort of five years or at least or longer, and you're going to go through the fluctuations because you, you have, your price your house doesn't change every single day, and if it does go down, it doesn't you don't have got to sell you just you live in it and and that's and that's the sort of the mentality I would say when it comes to investing certainly long term. You know, you, you, you've we, we, like two weeks ago, you went through a whole lot of stocks that you'd reasonably bought. You put short position, you'd put, um, you know, small, relatively small positions in. But you're happy to hold for a sort of long term. And, yeah. and, and who cares about you're not going to sell in the near term. And who cares what the you know, the share price does? Yes, it can be a bit sort of like it's a distraction. It, all it does, it, it can it can it can trigger things that you should and shouldn't do short term and can be suboptimal. So. As he says, as Warren Buffett keeps saying, you know, be a business owner or be a house owner with you in the same mentality as, as as owning stocks. Look at the long term, and you'll and you'll be you should be okay. Yeah, yeah, and 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 do you know what the exposure I have is 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 the reason also why you can think a bit more logically mm. and a, you know, a bit more rationally about companies because if you have a big position and you've gone in quickly and it goes against you, you start making silly decisions. Like uh, in, in a good example, you know, Money Supermarket came out with the results last week, decent results actually, mm. even excluding energy. You know, growth in all is twenty two percent up, uh, and um, on the day they released it, it dropped like a micro cap. It was it literally mm. went down, and I thought, what's going on there? But it yeah. I had a you know a massive position. I may be a bit worried, but uh, it bounced back up at the end of the day. And uh, mm. it was like so, so it was obviously someone dumping this. I mean, I 
than what happened there. But um, yeah, sometimes, you know, you've, you've got, I think in this kind of market, for me, it makes sense to ease in rather than just go crazy because it could be some volatility. I think there will be volatility. I mean, like I said, the S&P had a, a good rally in the NASDAQ and all that stuff and uh, quite a few markets have. And I think it's going to go, it's, you know, it's, it's Earnings are not going to knock it out of the park of the next, you know, most companies won't. Uh, and so I think the overall indices will trade sort of in a range and there'll be plenty of time to, you know, buy in at the low and, you know, and, and maybe if you want to take some profit at high, because I don't think we'll rally greatly, massively from here because the environment is, is it doesn't suit it for doing that, you know? So, mm. yeah. Uh, um, it was quite interesting, actually, on, on, money, on moneysupermarket.com. The reason why it went down is because, the board indicated they didn't see the benefits of a competitive energy market coming in in 2023. In 2023, they mentioned that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's what, and that spooked a few investors initially, and then, and then a few other serious professional investors thought actually, given gas prices are now below the actual um, level that you have that price guarantee, because I think the last time I saw European natural gas prices was about 50 euros uh, per, mm. per unit, which is the break even is about 70 at, at 2,500. So actually, even though management were indicating that they don't see a competitive, there is a chance that you could see you know, a very competitive energy market in 2024. And I think that's where people looked at it, thought, okay, well, if we don't get it short term, I'm not bothered. I'm, I'm, in, I'm buying yeah. money supermarket for longer than, you know, sort of six to 12 months. So yeah, I think exactly. that's why it went up. But uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the home services energy part is down, it's down 42%, so like 39.8 mm. million. But, uh, you know, if you look at money, for example, it's up to 103 million in revenue, up 37 percent, insurance up 8 percent. So all of the parts travel is up to 65 percent. Uh, but all of the parts of the business is going very well. It's just that energy. But when that comes and it will come back on, of course. Uh, so mm. they'll, they'll, I think they'll do very well. But, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm just happy to hold that. They pay a nice little dividend. It's fine. You know. Yeah. Well, uh, I've got plenty. Of, I've got plenty of cash coming in, hopefully, from uh, from Kreschik yeah. uh, in the next couple of weeks. That was uh the actual deal when it was sold at, at, at 401 was um, w- was made effective last week. Um, the shares have been delisted, so it's just really waiting for some um, cash to come, and then I'll have some more some more. How long funds does that take be- normally? Then that kind of thing. It's about three months. That's about the fastest it goes when they do a scheme oh, okay. of arrangement, yeah. um, because it has to go obviously to uh, the shareholders to approve, and then goes to the court to be sanctioned. And if there's any co- competition clearance which there was a couple i mean there's always competition but it tends to be sort of rubber stamped so three months is about the fastest you can do it and that's what what it was here um my personal view is i think the management team have done an absolutely brilliant job you know in terms of turning this business around and maximizing it the business is literally flying and i think you know even though it's the you know four pound is the, about the highest price it's been for for years i still think agrico have actually got a really good deal there um and yeah. um, they didn't buy it at an absolute top price they paid a decent you know fair a fair number but i think most of the synergies will go with the actual buyer but anyway i'm, I'm not greedy and i and i'm delighted about what happened and i'm delighted for the management team who have you know done a terrific job and made some good money on their options as well and um, I wish everybody you know, the best of luck. But for me, I'll obviously get some cash in over the next couple of weeks and then start to redeploy. And as I mentioned last time, I've got a toehold in Pfizer, which is a defensive mega cap stock. And I'll, I'll push that up from a sort of toehold position into a, um, a normal full position um, over the next month or so when I get the cash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, have you, so you're not tempted to go into any sort of uh, bombed out sectors like house builders or anything like that? Yeah, I am actually, but I've already got exposure to um, to house building oh. through Alico, through the you know the construction oh, yeah, yeah, software yeah, 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 guys, yeah. and I got it wrong with um, Purple Bricks. I mean, you know, they came out with news last week or two weeks ago that um, you know they're going through some strategic options and they had a profit yes. warning and the shares went down. So it's one of those things. I mean, uh, my my biggest learning on Purple Bricks, and I think this is really sort of like. Um, prevalent and uh, useful elsewhere is that it, it did used to be a well-known and at one time a very a, a pretty well-respected brand but it's it's been you know managed to such an extent that it's become damaged goods over the last three or four years and my thesis was such that it had come down so much that actually it discounted that it was dead but there was possibility as an upside albeit a low probability of them turning that brand around and frankly for consumer brands, it's a tough ask. And, and that's what's happened in terms of, mm. you know, Purple Bricks. They haven't been able to turn the, 
you know, turn that brand around and people still look at it as damaged goods because they haven't been able to get the traction that they need to. And um, I did actually mention it to the, you know, the CEO when I when I spoke to her, I said to her, you know, is this, is it, do we have to rebrand this? Call it, I don't know, purple sort of wall or something, I don't know, mm. something, or red or, or red bricks, I don't know, something like yeah. that. But uh, it was going to cost them a lot of money, so they've persevered with purple bricks and it, and it, and that's the that's the key. When you if you go for a company for a turnaround situation, it's a consumer yeah. brand. It is tough to do that. There aren't that many who do it, and that's my that was the mistake I made. I it was already priced in that it was damaged, but whether it could be turned around, and I was probably hopeful rather than actually um, the, the balance of probability wasn't wasn't fifty percent, and I, I saw it as upside, but got it wrong. And, and you just got to accept that you, I, I do that, you know, sort of like a third of my you know sort of um, investments lose me money, so I've just got to accept mm. that it's going to you're always going to happen if you're going to make sort of like progress. But but that was my mistake. I thought it could be turned around the brand, and it hasn't been able to do so. Yeah, you know, turnarounds are very hard. And they, like I say, they mm. are quite a high risk, aren't they? So, because uh, when you think about it, I mean, you see Ch- Ch- Charlie Munger, you know, of- often says, like, uh, just avoid making stupid decisions in investing. He says that. And he said, it's very, and it's very hard to do that because, you know, I've, I've, you know, literally created lots of rules for myself in the past and I, 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 can, I can quite easily break them. You know, when the emotion mm. comes into it and you see yeah. the upside and you, ooh, and you ignore certain rules you've, you know, written down mm. for yourself. So it's so easy to do that. And, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's hard enough to find a, a, a consistent good business, all right? It's growing and carrying on good value. That's hard enough in itself. And then you go down, oh, let's find, find a turnaround or something, and that, that'll get a really good upside. But you realize it's hard to turn around a business like that, especially mm. in the environment we're in, where, you know, the, house yeah. back, the background of the housing market and all that cost of living crisis. Yeah, it is hard. And, and it's almost like saying, you know, trying to avoid stupid decisions. And that's harder than you think. And uh, mm. just you know, sticking to the basics. And that's what I mean. They do, isn't it? Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett, sensible, boring investments. They say that mm. they've got obviously the money to make money from that. But I mean, it is hard just sticking with that, you know. I think you've just it. got. I think you, you may not make a stupid decision, but you make a decision that you go into it knowing w- what the what the risks are and yeah. what the potential outcomes are. And if and if that happens and the thesis doesn't, you know, work out that way. Then you know you just got to accept that uh, you know the outcome you were looking for didn't didn't occur. It, but I w- as I say, the mistake I made was such that I thought it could actually get turned around, and it and it may still ever if it was ever sold to somebody else, they may do turn it around. But I thought it was it was easier to do than than actually it just it just didn't hasn't happened so far, and that's why the stock has kept on going down. So. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, One I, I was tempted it one time. I mean, I looked at it on, you know, some requests on the webinar on the investment club, looked at it. I thought, God, they've got a tumbler of cash there, <laughs> and mm. minus EV and you know, all that. I thought, this, if, if it does turn around, they go play. And I realized then, a bit later on, they were still burning quite a bit, and the progress was quite slow. And mm. it's just one of those things I, I did. I stood back and watched for a while, you know, that, oh, no, I don't think it's going in the right direction there. So, um, yeah. but I, at one point, I was very tempted because just because the amount of cash they had and what they were valued at. Yeah, but there we are. Um, well, one, one stock that I really like, which I could be using on, you know, from the crest chip because it's in industrials, it's in the same sector, and I'll, I want to try and deploy it, is Avintraz. And they came out with half year results last week. And, and they are absolutely on track to, uh, you know, to do sort of like double digit top line growth and uh, sort of similar levels on, on, on EPS. They've got a strong cash, cash flow. And if you just recall, I mean, this is a specialist engineering business that does sort of like niche parts and services for the likes of HS2 for like blast proof doors or for these, you know, sort of like three, three meters by three meters um, secure storage boxes for low level nuclear waste into cellar field. And, and I'll just give you an indication of, of that. I mean, the, rev, the, the revenue visibility, they've got forward uh, order book cover for this year of 90% and 55% for next year for 2024 but when i i interviewed the ceo and the the, the cfo uh, last week and my, my jaw nearly hit the ground because they're so in sync with sellerfield in terms of these storage boxes for instance mm. they've already got a contract of 70 million and and they're, and um, they they they're, they're uh, supplying that again and, and making deliveries against that and then i asked him and said cuz he started talking about this additional contract that they could mention i asked so you know what's the scale what's the materiality 900 million could be a potential opportunity for storage boxes just out of Sellerfield in the long term. 
Well, George just hit the ground. I thought. I mean, they, they, he did. He did make a point. Absolutely, that he won't win all that because they would yeah. never give any that that amount of of contract just to one sole supplier. But that's just one opportunity. And yeah. um, obviously, yeah, they're delivering against. A, I think it's about a 30, 35 million contract with with, um, with it's their booth subsidiary for for uh, glass proof doors. And then they've still got things like you know other nuclear. That's nuclear extension and uh, you know like uh, lifetime extension. You've got decommissioning and the new nuclear formats coming at the small form. Plus, you've got the defence as well, and the energy is coming back when they do you know sort of oil and gas in the North Sea. So. Their their core businesses are flying, you know, basically flying on all cylinders there, um, and I think that sort of like underpins the share price currently from where it is. And then they started talking about their, um, you know, their sort of like their early, well, it's an early stage of commercialising it. Their healthcare division that uh, they've got two parts to it. First of all, is the they've got twelve percent stake in Adeptix, and they've got a convertible debt in there as well that has got FDA approval for their small form 3D X-ray machine. And that will start um, doing sales fairly soon as a soft launch and then a hard launch later on in the year. And then they've got sort of 74% of this Magnetica business that does a small form MRI. And that's going on the same sort of commercialization path and should hopefully start doing some sales sometime next year. And if you put those two together, you could double the shares if they, if, if they can actually, you know, move into the right uh, plan so yeah i mean that is really um r- you know really positive and my my fair value some of the parts goes to four pound 80 so uh and it's really something i might well buy once i get the cash from uh from from crestion because it sort of like fits that you know industrial um sort of like you know s- sector split and diversification i don't know if you've had a look at there what do you think of it yeah, no, I did. I looked through it on the on the webinar, and uh, I like it. But it, what, what I quite like as well is that if, if you look at the share price trends, it's, a, it's been an amazing performer over the last what five, ten years, <laughs> pretty mm. much. And then um, it, it has these periods where it consolidates, it rises for like six months, and consolidates for six months. And I think we're in this consolidation phase here, so it's almost like you've got plenty of time to do a bit of research on it uh, before the next leg up, you know, because it does happen. Mm. It takes some of these consolidation phases take a while. To build, but um, yeah, it's in this. Um, God, look at that! It went from uh, 190. <laughs> where was this? 2020, 190 to like 480 from 2020. Mm-hmm. Everything. So yeah, it moves. When it moves, it moves. So, yeah, I mean, um, it, it, yeah, if you yeah. look at if you look at a longer term, from I think it was about uh, 2012 or 2011 or something like that, it was at 33p, and now it's at nearly four quid or four three pound ninety. Which, uh, if you calculate through, is an average of twenty percent per annum compound average growth. <laughs> so it's been a pretty yeah. good achiever, to say the least. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, by I the way, one of my, one of my yeah. house builders came up with a, a bit of a few bit of results of the day. Yeah, which was one a, was that? MJ Gleason. Uh, MJ Gleason. Yeah, yeah. And and essentially, of course, it's not going to be that bullish. There's not going to be a lot of growth there because of um, the reporting period was when Liz Trust and Quasi Quateng <laughs> collapsed the <laughs> okay. mortgage market. So, um, but Oops. having said that, yeah, having said that, you know, they, they, well, they did uh, 894 homes sold, 932 the same period last year. Average selling price is up 15% um, and all that. But they did say at the end, which is quite nice, that net reservations in the last four weeks, this is now when stability is going back, uh, have doubled from the low levels seen before Christmas, uh, even though they're typically just below the, this time last year. But uh they say they're you know, quietly confident going forward. I think that's going to happen with, um, you know, the mortgage market. Even though you know, interest rates are higher, I think stability will happen. Of course, you won't see as many sales as going back as when the property boom happened and, and interest rates mm. are low. But I nevertheless think people still buy houses. There's still plenty, plenty of buyers out there. And now there's actually mortgage products out there. I think it'll be fine. You know, it's not going to blow the roof off. But um, like I said, they've, they've low net asset value. And um, I think going forward, there are plenty of cash. So yeah, I'm quite. It's, it's it's doing quite well on the chart. It's it's trying to break a new high in the chart, but it's 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 stumbling around a bit. But um, yeah, I quite like the momentum behind it. I think I think they'll recover in the next couple of years quite nicely. You know. Mm. No, I spoke to um, Paul Scott last week, and he, yeah. he he's bought it as well. He likes it. He's that's his number one uh, house building stock because it's in that affordable yeah. sector in the yeah. northeast and. Uh, should be, you know, it should be a good vehicle for sort of first time buyers. And the first time buyers are, are out there, actually. They don't yeah. seem to be too sort of like, you know, put off by um, sort of higher mortgage costs. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm, 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 I'm reasonably optimistic on the house building sector. Yeah, but they, they say there that the, the, the medium income, they look for medium income of £26,000. It's two bedroom homes start from 115000 mm. 
And so I think, if anything, you, you, you know, you're right there. People are looking for affordable homes. That's where, where to go. But, uh, yeah, again, I, I just like the chart there. It's recovering nicely. Fundamentals are fine. You know, it's, it's not overvalued. Uh, yeah. And I don't think, you know, the, I think that listen, the, the period they just reported, I think that's the worst period because there was very, I, I was surprised at the time. It wasn't like 1,300 mortgages were pulled from the market. I thought, mm. I didn't realize there's that many types of mortgage on the market. But, I mean, that's yeah. how many were pulled from the market. And if people can't get a mortgage, they can't buy a house. So that period is probably the worst period they're ever going to report on. And that's gone now. So the, hopefully the steady improvement now, you know? Mm. No, I agree. And, and then another one um, that I've been sort of like tracking is uh, is VentureLive. Not that they actually re- gave me any news, but it's partner out in China because of the reopening, Samarkand. They basically said that uh, they have this obviously disruption of reopening in China with the with COVID going rife, and therefore they saw disruption in in December. But from January onwards, they've had a big uptick, and uh, they reckon that there's uh, you know a 42 percent uplift in the amount of you know consumer savings in China, which they think like the Western will actually be deployed into sort of like you know services and products and stuff like that, and. Uh, they they're, they're very bullish, and if that happens, which is you know Samarza Samarkand is, is the um, distribution partner for Venture Life out in China. If that happens, you could really see a, a rebound in that particular market for the company, and nothing's built into the estimates, so uh, there's still plenty of juice in um, in Venture Life. And my fair value is over seventy p, and I can't remember what the, I don't know what the shares are this morning, but they're 44, probably about four forty five. Yeah, I was going to say mid forties. So there's still plenty of good upside there, and they're they've got a good tailwind behind them, not only from yeah. China, but just from all of their you know sort of over the counter type products, or you know sort of like the mouthwashes and stuff like that. So um, yeah, no, they're doing a good job. All they need to what? do is just to keep accelerating the growth. Yeah, well, do you know what? I've seen a lot of, it's a very similar chart to Gleason, oddly, but the recovery is on, you know? I mean, let's mm. say the last time, this was, it's, it's way above 200 day moving average, the, the, the Golden Cross has happened, and I see a lot of stops of this on AIM. I think I'd be surprised if we rolled back down to lows previously seen, you know, back in October, because I, I do think we've hit a bottom here. And the recovery process, though, you know, it takes a while, it takes many months, so there'd be a volatility, but... Yeah, I think we've we've uh, what eighteen months we've been in pretty much bear market, so that's around about the the, the the usual time period. But there's lots of stocks like this recovering now, you know, hitting two day mm. moving averages, and they they haven't been above these moving averages in the last year or so. So uh, that says something to me. There's momentum there behind quite a few stocks, you know. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Another one which came out with um, sort of like full year results was um, Lung Life, which basically is doing this um, validation study of its early stage uh, lung cancer uh, diagnostic um, that uh, is using um, uh, circulating tumor cells, which is really kind of cutting edge stuff to be able to uh, to do this early stage diagnosis for patients. Anyway, they should be at that should all. In the next two or three months, they'll have finished all the enrollment and then they'll have to get all the results from all the tests that's actually happened, which I think will probably sort of like be mid-year. And uh, and then it's really, start, you know, commercialising the actual, um, the diagnostic and making first sales at the end of this year. They've got a cash runway until mid-2024, so there's no problem there. And this morning, they also got... Um, they had, there, was a, there was an independent um, study done on the uh, economics of it. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it undoubtedly sh- sh- demonstrated that it saves the whole, you know, healthcare system in the uh, in the US, you know, a lot of money in terms of the, what the benefits of it, because with the early diagnosis. And that's, that all comes on top of the better outcomes for patients. So it's going to be a win-win. So as long as the result are favorable or, or just just confirm what it was before in this validation study i think it's going to be it's going to be an, i mean this i think the investors need to look at it if, they, if, if i've got more than a couple of months sort of like you know outlook etc early stage diagnosis of of, of cancer is mm. just and it's an untapped market 80 percent of people who get lung who get diagnosed with lung cancer do it in late stage so early stage testing is absolutely going to change that their, their whole outlook and the and the healthcare industry. And this is this is a multi-billion market just in the US alone. So you're going to see more than one company who is going to benefit. But you know, if, if you just put in like a hundred million, you know, rather than billions and billions into the top line, you, you're going to get a massive share price in performance. So this is this is one to you know sort of like it's it, it's doing everything that it says it would do at its IPO. It's on track. 
the you know the results are coming coming through it's had independent you know sort of like analysis on it that it, that it works and um you know it sets itself it's got medicare sort of coverage already it's got a price that it's to be accepted so i think it's got a really really sort of like you know rosy attractive future um for diagnostics in an untapped market yeah yeah and what is there a cash there or not have they got cash yeah no, they've got a cash runway they've got about eight million oh, yeah. uh, dollars okay. of cash net cash so they've got the cash runway until mid next year at least um so mid 2024 um, yeah. But by that time, they'll have had all the validation study. They'll have started to uh, get revenues. And the, the, if that comes through as planned, the valuation of the stock will be significantly higher. In fact, to be, I wouldn't be surprised if, if a big diagnostic business buys them. <laughs> because, yeah. you know, when you look at it, their unique technology, I mean, you know, you put that into a suite of diagnostics with the CT, you know, C sort of like, you know, uh, tests. This is high value. I mean, we're talking 80% sort of gross margins here. Um, yeah. So you don't need, you know, these things, you haven't got to move the dial on the top line much and you can pick it up for an absolute bargain. So, uh, hey, we'll wait and see. But they're, 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 the management team are doing everything that they said they would when it was IPO'd. And um, you know, in fact, if anything, they're doing more. Um, so just the shares obviously you know, have come down from where they were on the IPO because everything in that biotech sector has been sold off. Yeah, well, you know, I speak to Vadim Alexander, who's head of healthcare at SP Angel, and he's saying there's a lot of companies out there at the moment with good products, you know, good assets, uh, that yes. are the hammering. And he, and he said, and also he said, if you've seen one that's doing a good fundraise, even if it's at a discount, massive discount, and they've got a good cash runway now, do some research on them. And I tell you what, what one that fits is I spoke to actually the CEO and CFO on, on the week, Destiny's Farmer. Mm. Um, they just did a deal with a company called Sabula Pharma. Now, the deal for the, is the, the lead asset, and it's, it's C. difficile sort of uh, infections, it's already, it's, I think it's phase two already. But anyway, the deal with Sabula Pharmaceuticals in America, the deal is worth 570 million overall with royalties and stuff so that. And they've just <laughs> Only raised, 570 yeah. million. <laughs> but the thing is, what hit the share price, they released this news. They've got, they've got another pipeline, they've got two or three other sort of assets going on. But they released this news, which normally would have taken it through the roof. Uh, but then they announced uh, equity fundraise as well at a slight discount. Okay. And so the share price is still, so wrong. I think they're about 30 million market cap. They just raised 8 million. I think they had about two or 3 million anyway. Um, and yet now there's no future funding required for this lead asset because the, the, the bigger farms it becomes taking on that and they get royalties and payments up front then uh but so things like that with you know almost late stage clinical assets uh but now they've raised money and they've got a deal as well and it's, you know that that is, is worth looking at because these some of these stocks have been hammered you know absolutely hammered um and like i said normally that kind of deal DEST is a ticket there, but normally that deal would have blown the roof off, but then they did a fundraise straight away afterwards. Uh, and so that's obviously it hit the stock a bit, but um, cash, lead asset de-risked, and they got several other assets as well, you know? Yeah, I think there's some great bargains in the whole of that sort of like, you know, the healthcare, medical science industry, no doubt about it. I mean, just as a, again, another sort of like data point, and I mentioned it briefly last time. I mean, you know, I bought Amrit Pharma about 18 months ago, two years ago, and they're just going through it. They've just been, you know, they're going through a takeover now by um, uh, Chase Eye uh, Pharmaceuticals out in Italy. And there was a hundred percent premium. And this is the kind of thing, you know, you're going to get, suddenly somebody's going to put a number on, on the company and it's a hundred, a hundred, 200 percent premium. And it just seems like crikey, how, you know, how do they manage that? But it's because of the in, intrinsic value of the business is mm. so much more than the share price. So, um, I mean, another one which I think falls into exactly the same camp and, and also dovetails with what you've just said in terms of the fundraise is on Commune because it came out with sort of like um, its its final results for last year. They're a bit historical, but uh, they, um, you know, the, the underlying intrinsic value of that business is so much higher than where the shares are, given that the, the level and the treasure trove of that sort of research, you know, ba database they have with the, with the autoimmune um proteins etc the auto, the auto antibodies proteins and they, they've got a brilliant sort of relationships with large biopharmas in terms of long-term supply agreements the business is is delivering in terms of its top line growth i mean in the first half it sold more than it did for the, the previous 15 months so you know in in the current year um, so it's it's really growing well that's the immuno insights and this early cdt which is again another um early stage lung cancer test is making real traction with 
the CT scanners, you know, the likes of uh, Philips and, um, and Siemens. So it's making real progress on the operational front. But the shares went down today because it did actually say that it's, it's going to need to sort of like, you know, recalibrate its um, its debt position. It'll, it'll, uh, it's looking at some strategic options in terms of selling some assets to be able to pay down that or, or extend that, that debt or even refinance it. Um, so it's got it's got short term sort of the funding, but they're, they're basically that's the last piece in the jigsaw. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure they'll, they'll do that. But it, it, regardless, either way, this business is significantly undervalued. So, you know, if it stays at these levels, I just would not be surprised if somebody puts a number on it and buys it out. Because, um, I mean, nobody knows. And, and I, but, it, but when you've got such a fantastic and, you know, recognized technology, I mean, there's no way, you know, seven of the top 15 world's biggest biofarmers you know, rely for their R and D on a company that hasn't got good science. I mean, <laughs> let's be clear about yeah. it. It is top yeah. draw science. That mm. intrinsic value is 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 totally missed at the moment. Where the shares are, they're mispriced. So, somebody, it, hypothetically, if somebody ever put a number on this one, I'd be stunned if it wasn't sort of like you know four, five, six hundred percent premium because it, you'd be well over a pound, if not pound fifty, or I, I don't know exactly. I'd have to work it all out, but. Uh, significantly higher than where the shares are because all we're talking is they've taken a bath because of this uh you know the concern over the uh, over the financing but i'm pretty sure they'll, they'll be able to get that one sorted out and when they do you know yeah. then um this is 80 percent uh, drop through business in terms of ebitda on that immuno insights uh company so anyway let's Let's wait and see. But there's, as we rightly say, there's lots of world class assets that are just totally mispriced in this whole area at the moment. Yeah, 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 exactly. And uh, well, I say, once the big risk is there's funding, but once they get that funding, it'll probably jump um, aggressively. You know. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, what... absolutely. And, and, it, and it, let's be clear about it: they may get the funding because somebody buys them out beforehand. Mm. <laughs> it just, yeah, you know, these yeah, things yeah. these things can happen, can't they? Because people think, right, okay, well, I'll. Uh, Thank you very much. I can then repay the debt, and I get this brilliant asset for free. But uh, anyway, let's let's wait and see. All all the management team can do is not is do what it it says it's going to do, which it is. It's on track to hit its uh, its numbers. It's um it's going to be cash flow uh, neutral for this year, and um you know it's got it's it's growing, you know exponentially at the moment in terms of that immuno insights. I mean next year as like you know not the current year but the year afterwards if it carries on sort of like this level of growth it's going to be easily EBITDA positive and cash flow positive in, in 2024 there's just no estimates currently from the house broker but it but it certainly will be so yeah just get that balance sheet sorted out and uh, then uh, it's going to be on a totally different trajectory yeah cool uh, anything else, any any other stocks worth looking at uh, no, what about you? Are you looking at sort of like, um, any hey, I'm of the... always looking at stocks. It's like, I, I literally, yeah. you know, go two, three, uh, analyze, you know, I, I try and at least analyze a, a company one a day at least, um, mm. probably more than that. But, uh, there's always stuff out there. It was like, you know, they're not at the moment, they're just not moving anywhere. I was thinking, I'm not going to put money into companies whose momentum will go in the wrong direction because you can get them a lot cheaper. Like I said, they can get, you know, mm. selling attracts selling and, um, so they can get down. So I'm just sitting and waiting. I think it's just trying to conquer that patience uh, you know thing because having cash but having patience is two different things and so it's almost like you know having a shopping basket you're walking around a nice shop and then thinking, i'm not gonna buy anything but uh yeah. <laughs> it's just having that but no there's plenty of uh, options out there i think but um yeah i just i, I just you see how it goes isn't it really um yeah i mean i think as i say one i know you've probably got it i mean i've talked to nauseam but it, you know, equals has come down to like mid to low eighties, sort of eighty three today. And you look at that, okay, and that's the momentum's not there at the moment, but it will return that one <laughs> because yeah, the no, top I, I, the top line but, momentum, the underlying business, I'm pretty damn sure is is not losing any momentum. In fact, the yeah, the intrinsic value of that business is growing by the day, and the and the share price is coming down as people just sort of like you know use it as an ATM. Yeah, yeah. No, do you know what? I did cover the chart on that on the, on the webinar saying, listen, we've got a, a, a death cross here. I mean, death crosses don't always signify a big fall off. It can go sideways for a while and, and go in a range. But um, mm. like I said, you know, it's been on a tear, hasn't it? Equal share price. And literally, it's only touched the 200 day moving average a couple of times. And mm. uh, it's doing that recently. Yeah. But um, I tell you what, I'd be pleased at, right, Paul? So every, I've got a spreadsheet that's got literally, I measure every company on 
but five metrics under each of these uh, headings, which is growth, value, uh, health, efficiency, momentum. And uh, and I, I thought, right, I realize I, I can put a sort of little point scoring system, just compare each other companies together. And so I've done this now with many companies. There's about a list of mm. 30 there so far. Top of the list so far, it was money supermarket, right? Because just the margins and the growth. Top of the list that beat it recently is our number one in the chart, Argentex. Oh, okay. Literally, yeah, they are, yeah. They're, they are, they're, I mean, the score for the maximum you can score on this sort of rating is 108, and they've got like 98. Mm. And so they're looking very good in every metric. I mean, you know, growth, value, you know, cash generation, margins, momentum, everything is looking quite good, you know? So, yeah, mm. it's nice to see that. It's quite interesting, actually, because that's one area that you and I definitely differ because. In your screening, you do you momentum. If it's positive, you go for okay. Yeah. I look at it so it's, if, if if it's negative momentum, but the but I think the underlying value is increasing, as in like you know with with equals. Actually, negative momentum is a big attraction. So I would I, if it's got negative momentum, I would score that highly, whereas you score it lowly, which is quite an interesting sort of like way yeah. of we look at it, look at things in terms of you know sort of like price versus value. Yeah, yeah, no, but this this, this screen, you know, puts all of them in. It's like growth, value, health, efficiency, and then momentum is very key. Because I mean, looking at this, thinking, do you know what? All companies that perform start sort of showing certain momentum traits. That's it. Uh, and so you can sit, like I said, you can sit and wait they for don't, companies though. to achieve That's this. That's the point. That's the whole point. They no, don't. They will, well, they, will, they will. Look at equals, for example. Perfect example, right? It, it equals that Argent text, right? Now, the last time. The the, the the 50 day crossed the 200 day on the upside, right? This was back in January 2021. Share price then was 28 pence. Okay. Now, initially, you know, you look at them on, on the fundamentals as well and then put that into it. But then once that started happening, just sit back and wait then. And then you could just wait for the other thing to happen the other way around. But, um, uh, you know, it, it, it has to. It's all the share price. It doesn't. Price. It doesn't. That's where that's, 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 that's the point is it's such that you take positive momentum. Yeah, as what uh, uh, as something you're going to be you're really looking for, and it's a must have. Whereas I take negative m- momentum. It's actually that's really quite interesting. I, I, I'm I'm interested if I think the business is flying and doing really well. If I can get it at a cheaper price and somebody's selling, I can then chuck a big number. I can put you know reasonable liquidity in or or oh, whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. as people I, sell. Yeah. So so this is, yeah. all I'm saying is it's as an observation. The two different mm. strategies. I'm yeah. more interested when shares fall off. Whereas you're more interested when they go up. No, no, I will monitor them if they fall off. If the company's like, if the fundamentals are very good, right, and they're, and they're, and they're falling down, I'll, I'll always monitor them. But a cheap share can keep getting cheaper. And in the, like I said, in, in a bear market, it can continue happening. If, you, if you're happy, if you're... So yeah, I don't like pretty much the pain of seeing the share price portfolio value go down, down, down. So I'll just wait. I'll just wait until I get in there because that can happen. And I've seen a lot of people say, I'm going to buy the dip. Well, well it's, in a bear market, it isn't a dip. It's a downtrend. It's a different thing. In a bull market, the trend is going up. There's a dip and it goes, but it's a trend. So what I'm saying is, you know, if you like a company fundamentally, uh, I, I just want to keep averaging down. It's, it's, it's a big difference in a, in, a, in a bull market. You can average down. You sort of be okay. You're buying a dip in a bear market. It's not the case. You can keep buying for years and you end up dragging your entire portfolio value down. So uh, if you're happy with that kind of emotional pain, it's fine. And if you still see the business improving and it's getting better value, yes, but your portfolio is also becoming cheaper. So yeah, I, I mean, I'm just thinking it's a better way. So I'm trying to find a way of, fine tuning timing it a bit more rather than just saying just jumping in straight away that's all i'm trying to do you know so that yeah, way yeah no, no i understand to, as yeah. i say just an interesting mm. observation you know, in mm. terms of you know as i say they come down and i can you know if i'm interested and i think the business is doing well i can get volume whereas when they start going up and you say right okay the momentum is you can't always find sellers when when share prices are going up whereas you can find plenty when they're selling <laughs> oh yeah 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 absolutely yeah yeah <laughs> So yeah, anyway, no, I mean, it just, it, I mean, it just... no, no, it's true. It's one of the reasons why I looked at this as well. I, I added momentum to my sort of filters is because, um, yeah, I was, I was, I was sick of averaging down and the, the share price keep going down. I think bloody hell, <laughs> it's annoying. So I thought, well, it's going to be a bit, a bit of a finer way of doing this. So that's all I've added it in. It's, it's one of five filters, but I mean, it's yeah, quite yeah. important, you know, but, um, 
There we are. But it, who knows? You know, equals could be getting, uh, you know, cheap here could be in cheaper. Could just yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, it, I don't, I don't be, know. Has, it has well, before. It's bounced. It's before it has bounced off this, off these kind of when it's gone below the 200 day moving average. So there's no reason why I wouldn't do it again if the business is strong, you know. All I would say is that for long term investors, a 15% fall from all time highs is absolutely nothing. Okay. Because you get that for all kinds of different stocks. Yeah. And if, you, if you're micromanaging it and worrying about a 15% fall just because somebody's taking profits or a number of people are taking profits, you're in the wrong game, mate, in terms oh, yeah, of yeah. what's worth to concentrate on the long-term trajectory of this business. And um, I don't, I, who knows? There might well be something which I haven't seen or whatever like that. But I would be stunned by the end of March, they don't produce some pretty good numbers and a decent outlook, like like, like with Argentex and stuff. Yeah, and that's yeah, why yeah. I that's why I say is it's that when they've got a seller out there, yes, it may not, it might have maybe this death cross, it may be this negative momentum, but actually that might be the only time you're going to get in when somebody's yeah, selling true. because you can't, yeah, so it, because if it goes up, you're not going to get a chance to get in. <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's true. I mean, you know, it's saying that it's what is it? What's what's the my cap? Hundred and what fifty something? Yeah, yeah, about hundred and fifty mil. Yeah. It's, yeah, no, uh, yeah, absolutely. You play it either way, and um, you know, let's say if the, if the business is there, the fundamentals are there, it'll it'll continue to rise, you know. Mm. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, I could, I could hold this. I could hold, ways, I could hold Arge, Argentex and equals for the next three, five years, easy, yeah, exactly. and, I've, and I've held them, yeah, yeah. I've held them for, for a long time already, yeah, yeah, I hope yeah, I do, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. The way. Exactly. The way. You know, it's the same thing. Is that there are good businesses, and when it comes down to it, you know, when you're investing, do you own a, want to own a share of a good business? Yes, you do. You know, and that, it's not a turnaround. You know, it's a good business that's improving. You know, and that's you know they're hard to find. You know, they're not they're quite rare those kind of businesses. I know. Uh, marvelous stuff. Cheers, Matt Bella, and yeah, we'll speak in two weeks. Time.